first of all, I'd like to thank Games for, Games for Change for this opportunity and for creating such a necessary platform. G4C has recognized the phenomenal so <coughs> social power of entertainment. And it's because of our shared vision in building positive global relationships using this power that I'm here now. Before I delve into how I've personally been inspired, I'd like to reintroduce you to my nation and my region. A part of the world immersed in negative focus, a focus that even I, at times, was led to believe. I hope that I may be able to open your eyes to the opportunities affecting change within the Arab world but also show how change is already occurring, and most importantly, invite you to support us in what is already happening. Popular media rhetoric defines everything that does not conform to the perceived norm as other. The Arab world is notor notoriously attached to this label. How can being defined as other help us? Especially when this particular other is defined as the planet's villain a destructor, a terrorist, a demon, celebrated when attacked. Who was in charge of developing this construct in the first place? And does the other ever have a say in the matter? Have these perceptions set us on a path towards some morbid set of exaggerated stereotypes, ignorances, and most of all, fear? What does this mean for an Arab world that is evolving as fast as it is? Somewhere, there's discourse going around about how the planet presents itself. A kind of wild conflict between global vision and local reality, with one side winning most of the time. We need to get back on track, overcome an obvious dichotomy collectively, build more, a more celebratory narrative when it comes to diversity, and, champ and champion the creativity that can be born of it. It's an inspirational part of humanity that no matter where people are, if they embrace change and open themselves to new ways of thinking, they tend to express themselves in creative ways, challenge perceived norms, and shut down all kinds of stereotypical labels. Instagram stars sweeping the Middle East are a great, are a great example of this. Insta-famed Arabian women embrace technology, social media, and strong visual narratives to express their style and love for fashion and the arts. By adopting these expressive social formats, the, the, they have developed a successful and very real social change. 35% of tech entrepreneurs in the Middle East and North Africa are women, compared to 10% globally. Many of these women found their path into business through social media and e-commerce. On the ground, this has translated to an impressive level of female employment growth. In Saudi Arabia, women employed in the kingdom's private sector has risen from 55,000 in 2010 to 454,000 in 2013, according to figures from the Saudi Ministry of Labor. So, how does that affect our perception of the other? At least, the benefits of female empowerment in the region are felt, if not directly affecting how the outside world views us. <clears throat> Saudi's Glow Work and its annual career fair has successfully connected hundreds of women to jobs in 2000, since 2013, changing the reality of women at, at work in the nation. This is in part due to the power of creative technologies organic infrastructures, binding governments, private sector, academia, and NGOs have rapidly surfaced over the past five years. Saudi's National Creative Institute, founded by Ms. Sofana Dahlan, is one of these. Despite the various challenges faced by women globally, from, equal, from unequal pay here in the US to movement restrictions in Saudi Arabia, there's no value in attaching the label of other when all are seeking progress. The undeniable achievements and equal abilities of women in any given society worldwide is something that I believe we must champion, be it locally or globally. 
Now, let's continue the quest to question this other that is the Arab world. In Saudi Arabia, more YouTube videos are consumed than anywhere else in the world. Young people under the age of 35, like myself, make up 70% of the Middle East. YouTube has been tapped into by a number of creative, uh, creative collectives, expressing themselves with innovation and confidence. Then there's Jordan, the geographical headquarters of Nam. Here we've seen tech sector's revenue grow from, <clears throat> from 300 million in 2012 to, to 2.3 billion in 2013. A recent article in the Financial Times highlighted Georgian's position as the Middle East tech leader in development. Pretty much a startup spring. So, where's our view of the other now? One thing's for sure. Talent is emerging from all corners. And there's a growing infrastructure of support that continues to expand. This is bringing about profound changes that I believe will help dissolve the stereotypes and perceptions surrounding the other. I'm proud to have witnessed, facilitated, and contributed to this brand new tech-led art-based future that bases itself on dedication and defiance. A new future that is well-versed in its struggles, and yet filled with pearls of creative cultures held back by nothing, not bureaucracy, nor fear or failure, and certainly not by the perceived realities attached to the label of other. I'd like to tell you a little bit more now of how this all relates to me and a little bit about my worldview. I grew up in Saudi. I was educated there. I also grew up in America. I was educated here too. Marginal in both and unsure of what was home. Today, the only constant I have to any sense of home is the internet. The internet is my home. Virtual world, worlds and its tools, building an, a, a network of like-minded individuals with whom I could express myself freely, was how, I, was how I used and utilized the internet. I grew up with an exposure to many realities, the arts, games, entertainment, social and political nuances, some true, some not, some I defined for myself, others defined for me. Overall, three key characters apparently represented who I was and what I believed in, none of which were created by me, all of which can be found and mixed up in the label of other. Three narratives about me not told by me. One, Osama bin Laden. Not me, not the Arab world. Two, Aladdin. <laughs> not me, not the Arab world, although flying carpets would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> evil and oppressive dictator of the day. Not me, not the Arab world. So there it was. Three exaggerated cells that had nothing to do with me. Three simplified descriptions of a people who had so much more to their characters. All created by media, by media commentators and further intensified by a series of tragic events. I asked myself a whole bunch of perplexing, possibly paranoid questions. Was this intentional? Why was I so often misrepresented? Is someone doing this on purpose, generally, generally presenting me as some supersized, bearded, brown-skinned terrorist? I didn't know. I still don't know. All I knew at that point of realization was that I had to play my part in disrupting this narrative, in contributing with positivity to this global story, using my position to give the others an opportunity to share their voice, to share their truth, and that is where Facebook Arabic came into play. I joined in 2008 to help develop Facebook in Arabic, and whilst I knew I could be used, it could be used for many things, 
my primary interest in Facebook and Arabic was as a tech solution for women in the Middle East to make real use of this new phenomenon in social interaction, to empower the many entrepreneurial spirits that I knew existed in my community. Women and men who could find their own ways to build businesses from the comfort of their own homes without the worry or need to move around and because of the obstacles that they may face. But still, despite my successes at Facebook and Facebook Arabic, general perceptions of the Arab world never seem to accurately represent our story, our development, and our position. So I was driven to tell our true story and to inspire change through creativity. I sat down, combined the, trans the transitioning aspects of my life, personal, observational, professional. I examined my creative desires, the creative desires and needs of my society, and then combined all these elements into one platform. Naam. Naam stands for New Arab Media. It also means yes in Arabic. Founded with the very desire to deliver change through creativity, with an aim of building, shaping, and supporting Arab content and entertainment online. Across its three divisions, Naam Games, Naam Enterprises, and Yalla Ta'lim, we, we create, promote, license, and develop content and products from games to, anima to animated series, web comics, to educational software. But it isn't just about, about Naam's output. It's also about what Naam represents. By producing games that are for and about the Arab world, a void is filled for underserved markets and audiences in, the, in gaming and in the media, openly welcoming the rest of the world to discover new content and stories. From racing and adventure to competitive sporting games, young enthusiastic developers are able to share and celebrate their culture, and their inspirations, which without support would not be given a chance, let alone compete in a flourishing global market. Organizations like NAM act as an empowering launchpad into the region's young world, <coughs> world of creative innovation. This way, we begin to see the other self-define. Meet Abir. Nan's only female programmer. She's a testament to what can happen when someone's given the encouragement to embrace their creative spark and the opportunity to explore where that could take them. Abir is a brave example of the Middle East artistic renaissance. She moved away from the preferred and more traditional um, career paths. Many of us are forced to take by our parents encouraging us as this is the right way and into what she believed was her true calling. Despite the typical discouragement, Abir explored her creative passions for games and came to Naam with a wish to develop herself and games. Now a, successful, now a successful programmer with the number one educational game in the region under her belt, Allah Haruf, she has inspired others. She even remembers the pride the day she came back home with her first paycheck and showed it to her father showing that her dreams were now as tangible for her as they were once intangible for him. Abir found her passion and expression in building games, supporting her family, and gaining an independent sense of personal fulfillment and professional fulfillment. Abir is not the other. Abir is everyone who chooses to make something of themselves. Currently, Naam is based out of Jordan and Denmark, Developing, cult cult developing culturally sensitive individuals, and transmedia content, which, one, which of course includes a bunch of kick-ass games. Our 21-strong team, <coughs> leading from, you know, that are made up of leading programmers and video artists, hail from a total of 12 different countries, and we hope to continue to grow. Prince Hassan of, of Jordan once said, resilience, is actively making meaning out of diversity. This statement is precisely the reflection of my vision. 
the future isn't ahead of us. It's now. It's happening. And we're here asking all of you to join us in making it better. Content can save lives, but it can also demonize them. In Chapel Hill, Paris, Ferguson, even here in New York, apparently it can also kill them. Single story narratives are problematic. Lack of diversity in content is dangerous. From producers to consumers, no one is safe from this danger. Nam already knows this, and that's why we're playing our part in seeking balance, empowerment, and authenticity in storytelling. All of us are a part of this animated renaissance. By destroying divisions and redefining the way relevant and social content is produced, Nam is helping to create a revolution, a revolution as it happens, led by Saudi girls. Thank you. Get uh, questions from the audience, but we'll start with one question uh, that is interesting to me. We saw one last slide in your presentation. Yes. Pretty mysterious that said Saudi girls' revolution. Yes. And, you know, looked a bit like maybe a comic book, maybe a game. Um, well, it's. Um, we're, uh, we're also going to have a booth at, uh, uh, on Friday for, uh, for Games of Change uh, for Naam. So you can come and get to experience what that content is about, but it is going to be um, a comic book series that leads into um, a game um, focusing on um, new possibilities and new futures and, and, and discussing um, certain issues that relate to Saudi women uh, exaggerated in a post-apocalyptic world. Um, so it's like a sci-fi scenario. Pretty much. Yeah, it's and, and the protagonist? Um, we're focusing on um, trying to represent um, different uh, stories and demographics of Saudi women in, this, in, in the uh, protagonists that we have in this content. We have seven girls. Um, a brief is uh, women are, uh, uh, in, the, in this post-apocalyptic future, women are placed in concentration camps. Conservative men are ruling the land, controlling resources, and it's the story of the girls breaking out and uh, liberating um, the, that, the Arabian Empire and finding their place as leaders and the friendship that they build over time, which is where the comic book comes. Um, so I'm very excited. This hopefully comes out at the end of the year. Um, and um, hopefully you guys are excited about it as I am because I think it's the first time that we're seeing um, uh, Arab women um, in a powerful, empowering role where they're actually relatable um, and most importantly, not over-sexualized. Um, and not because of censorship, but because that's just not, you know, Tomb Raider and all these types of contests, which I loved, grow you know, growing up, is I don't feel is a true representation of the diversity within women. Um, and we wanted to showcase uh, their strength in our game. Great. So I it's really, I mean, especially hearing about that and thinking about uh, Saturday on the public arcade where it's free and accessible to all. It's really an honor to have you here and uh, very exciting. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, let's, let's do some uh, Q&A. Let's, uh, let's get questions from the audience, please. And let's have mics for the people that ask so everybody can hear it. Nothing's off limits, guys. Nothing off limits. No, good. This is my good oh, luck charm. Thank, I thank you. So <laughs> it looks really good. I'm going to get one too. <laughs> Um, so you talked about NAM um, and it's focused on the Middle East. Is there any room for your organization to, I guess, um, focus on maybe the Western world and the U.S.? Well, uh, are we Europe? seeing, I'm uh, sorry to cut you off, I apologize. Um, seeing as we're building on a global platform and are have direct distribution globally, we are creating our content to be seen and, and, and experienced by the rest of the world. Um, but um, first and foremost, we are um, identifying the Arab demographic as the key. And we're talking about Arabs in the Arab world and Arabs all over you know, the, the rest of the globe, uh, whether they're descendants of Arabs or um, natives that are living there for whatever reason. We wanted to kind of get them and say, hey, we, we, we hear you. We are ca catering to you, but all our content uh, from you know, first uh, launch is bilingual. And like most hopefully successful companies we are, who want to grow, we're going to um, start introducing other languages as well. Thank you. 
Great. More questions, please. No. <laughs> you should see my cousin. She's white, blonde, and blue eyes. Her, when, when I look at the Middle East, I see um, a huge diversity in viewpoints about the Islam religion and people who agree or disagree. Um, you know, s some are very acceptant, but there are, there are many others who are not very acceptant. Are you targeting also um, games uh, to change or, or model behaviors regarding uh, tolerance for religion um, and lack of intolerance as, as well as, um, you know, sex and gender? Um, well, you know, we're at Games for Change. And uh, that's the, the mandate of, the, of, of our, um, our, uh, our company and, and the team that we put together is to address all these different issues. And because that to me is um, what art is. Art is supposed to be a reflection to society. It's supposed to challenge and, and, and push people further. And that's why, you know, as I said in my, uh, in my keynote, um, is it's not, I don't believe that the revolution that's happening in the Middle East is a political one. Of course, there are drives for it. We've seen it happen in various countries before, specifically for Saudi. I would say that what I truly believe it's, it is happening is an artistic renaissance. Um, this new digital um, um, uh, plane is, is allowing us to show the world and ourselves and each other um, how that we are individuals, that we do have these different, you know, and you know co complexities about about our, our our being. So we want to address that. We want to serve all the different and diverse Arabic market. Um, our goal is obviously to push and uh, and help elevate consciousness um, to allow people to start thinking critically, to start discussing issues. Um, our our goal is not to create um, to attack or create dialogue that is um, telling people what they should do or that we're trying to, to manipulate their p viewpoint. I think it's it's focusing on on what we can contribute that can be a positive um, uh, push, I guess, towards dialogue regarding tolerance of all kinds. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, you you that raised uh, your hand behind the gentleman. Yes. testing with the younger age group in, in your part of the world? Great question. Um, so uh, it's exciting because our first game uh, was uh, Yalla Huruf or Let's Go Alphabet, basically focusing um, on uh, kids from three to eight, uh, teaching them how to learn the Arabic alphabet, but also improving their motor skills. So basically the interaction is that the kid not only sees the letter, but it's traced out and they have to follow these dotted lines. Um, and as it progresses, the dotted lines disappear and the kid has to do it from memory. And we've um, been able to, we've worked with uh, schools in Jordan. Um, and uh, my goal for our education division is to actually introduce it as part of uh, the curriculum in a lot of the smart schools that are being now open in, uh, in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in the, in the UAE, and in Kuwait. Um, we are also working with the University of Helsinki, which um, basically about the, gamef the gamification of academic information, right? Um, and with the Allah Haruf, we're able to engage with that. We're still growing in that sector. Um, and uh, it's, it's really important because we wanna target kids from that young of an age, <coughs> whether locally or globally, to introduce new images. Even in our game, we actually have a desert rat, which is very local to Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, more colloquial stuff like that and localized content gets people engaged. But yeah, kids are a huge, huge part of our, uh, they're the future. Uh, so it's a huge part of our, um, what we're trying to do. And also if you guys wanna try out that game or get a little glimpse of um, Saudi Girls Revolution in our demo, I have uh, some NAM team members with the t-shirts on and iPads, so just bother the hell out of them. Don't worry about it. And, and I just want to add, I mean, you, you didn't do a kind of in your keynote, the promotion to necessarily the success of those games. What I heard from, from you and your team is that there are already eight games that were made. Yes. Some of them with hundreds of thousands of downloads. Some of them go to number two or uh, number one on the App Store, correct? Uh, yes, in Saudi Arabia, our game Run Camel Run, which is actually uh, um, uh, a game that I based on my dad. My dad loves camels. I, I know I'm trying to like change stereotypes, but some things <laughs> you just can't help. Um, 
So the, uh, the, uh, the camel's name is Faisal. Um, and it's based on just introducing, I wanted with that content, which ended up being uh, uh, holding the number two pl uh, place in the local Saudi um, uh, iTunes store, um, being one of the only Arabic company that's actually in the top five. Um, and with that, I wanted to introduce um, everything that you put out there is a test. Everything that you put out there, especially with an undetermined market that you're trying to serve for the first time, you don't know what's going to happen. So with that game, which I encourage you guys to, to experience, is um, I want to create content that addressed a lot of the stereotypes that are usually connected to the Middle East, camels, um, you know, being bombed, you know, magic carpets, minarets, and introduce it with a localized um, humor to it. So I do actually the voice of the camel, um, and every time he dies, he curses in Arabic, um, which got us into a lot of trouble, which is great. Um, but that was it, that, that reaction, and kids are actually um, reacting to it, and that was a great successful experiment, I think, that just as luck might have it, ended up to be one of our successful games. Great. We have probably time for one or two more questions. Um, let's try to go beyond our site. Yeah. You, you've got one um, hub in, in Denmark. What made you choose Denmark? Um, have you been to Denmark? <laughs> right? Um, um <laughs> Various reasons. The f first and foremost, it's it's important for me, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, w w having a, an, um, a, an international and global uh, core group of, of uh, that make up uh, the company isn't. It was not an accident. I wanted, because of my experience in Facebook and watching people coming in from all different backgrounds and learning through a shared passion to solve problems and build infrastructure and create departments. I wanted to do that and be truly global from day one. But I also want it to be a safe haven um, for artistic and creative Arabs or descendants of Arabs or those who are um, you know, interested in the Arab world and want to contribute in ways that are not refugee camps, that are not you know, uh, the traditional sectors. Um, and uh, in Copenhagen, oh, I'm sorry, in Denmark, Denmark has the largest uh, populations of Arabs within the Nordic countries. Um, and we wanted to be as close as possible to them. We wanted them to find a place for them to connect to their roots, to redefine their identity, because their perspective is equally as important as those of us that were born and raised in the Middle East. Um, so, and it's also what from a technical standpoint, everybody knows that um, mobile development and gaming and, and animation in all the Nordic countries and also specifically um, uh, you know, in uh, Denmark, is is a huge market. It'd be, uh, you know, this is a strategic move, but also, it's one of you know one of the safest cities in the world, the uh, Copenhagen, which is something, ironically, I personally never experienced. I went from growing up in Saudi, to living in LA, then San Francisco, then a little bit New York, now London, and I'm going to Berlin next. So I don't know what I'm doing with myself. But I wanted to be in an environment where I could um, challenge myself. Okay, so you, you wanted to, yeah, please. Thank you. Oh, I think you may have just deflated my question by saying you don't want to do anything with refugees. Because my question was going to be, I'm working on projects you know, for you know, the hundreds of thousands of refugees from Syria in the last several years. You know, and there's a huge gap because you know, the major agencies are not funding education. It's a disaster, because you know, what it's going to breed is a whole generation of resentful kids who are going to be resentful when they grow up, and God knows how that will play out. You know, and now, with a million fleeing Libya, uh, I just wonder, is there anything we can do? We could take this offline, but there, uh, is there anything we could do to bring education you know, to, you know, th those, to those kids? Because I want them to grow up having choices and alternatives and hope. Thank you. No, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your passion. And I think that's a great example of, of the questions and the, the things that we need to actually address. Um, and this can only happen when we're given a platform to be able to have this dialogue. So thank you for this. Um, I would say that it's extremely necessary uh, because my belief is out of these kids that have nothing to lose but everything to gain, that we are going to see the true empathetic leaders of the future. 
I don't think it's any family. I don't think it's any existing uh, government or tribe or whatever it is. I really think that these kids have the key because they understand what they what 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 brought us apart, right? But um, I think from now we can say that we've um, focused on being present as an option for education and information for these kids. And uh, we've been having dialogue. That's why we signed with the Princess Sumeya University of Technology in Jordan. Everybody knows that's why we're also based in Jordan. We have Syrians who also are part of our team. So this is a, it's not something, it's not a fad. It's not something that we also um, treat very lightly in, se in the sense, of, oh, this is really cool. This will make us look cool. Like we, if we're going to do this, it's going to be part of the curriculum. It's going to be something that we really delve into because they, their brains are what I would want to hone and, and help grow. Um, and that, you know, if the international community wants to jump on board and we can make this a movement, that would be even better. Thank you. That's great. And uh, Prince Fahd, I want to say again how excited I am. I mean, to me, really, this session, it's one and before it. It's like that's the essence of Camp Shushan. You know, bringing something completely from another place, so edgy, so provocative, and so unexpected. And so great. necessary. So necessary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.